I came here in 94. I was six years old, and between that time, I lived with my mom in Jamaica. I didn't know why my dad took me up here, but I didn't have that father-son relationship as most kids would have. I got in trouble one day at school where it was expulsion, no longer suspension, and both my parents had to be there. I told them I did not live with my mother, I only lived with my dad, so they did some background check, and they had found out that I'm not supposed to be living with my dad at all. I was supposed to be with my mom. As much as he was bad to me and my brother, like, you know, it wasn't being a father. My dad was one of those guys that I had something that I knew he was doing, and I couldn't take it no more because I tried my best to, like, you know, tell someone about it. Can you tell us what it was? Honestly, yeah, I don't mind. You know what I mean? We moved just to Kipling, Finch and, um, Finch and Western Road, right? With a woman he had met here in Kipling. And my dad was, you know, he looked at her daughter, like, you know? My dad was doing stuff with her 13-year-old daughter from she was 13. And when I found out, she was 15. You know what I mean? For somebody to, you know, look at a little kid and do that stuff, and with evidence and all this stuff, and the cop told me they could only hold him for a year. A year. One year. I didn't show up to the trial. It wasn't worth it. You know what I mean? It wasn't. So I took justice in my own hands. I waited for my dad everywhere he went. When he go by a convenience store, when he go buy his lottery. I had my friends waiting for him. We robbed him. We beat him up. I waited for him to come off, come off a bus from work. I stoned him all the way to his house. He took that girl's innocent. The mother is still with him. And you know, my stepsister, she ended up being pregnant, and she went to a group home, and now I have no clue where she is or how she's doing, but. Was it your father? You would love for me to say that, wouldn't you? <laughs> I, have a, I have a brother and a step-nephew at the same time. Yeah, pretty sick, pretty cool. Whichever way you want to look at it. It is what it is. Ricky was kind of in rough shape. He had a lot of attitude and uh, behavioral issues. My upbringing, um, I actually grew up in Regent Park and kind of understood some of the issues he was uh, going through when he came here. Brad, Brad, like, you know what? He, un he understood, you know, he understood me, you know what I mean? It's very easy as a a youth worker to get discouraged because sometimes it can take two years, five years, and you know, after a while, you, you, you almost think, like, Am I wasting my time? Brad wasn't like the other staff. Most of the staff, they had given up when long because you know, how many times could you, could you talk to someone before? You know what I mean? You could ask anybody here about Brad. Like, you go out and ask anybody. He's not a staff, he's a, he's a, he's a friend. You know what I mean? He's one of the boys. As we built a rapport with him, and uh, sitting down with him over and over again over the years, I think things really started to sink in and I think he really realized that we actually care for him. To see somebody that's not a family member, not a friend, just a complete stranger, just cares so much about you, man, shows a lot. It shows a lot, it really does. And you know, I wish I'd taken it sooner because you know, I probably would have been in a better place a lot faster than I am in now. But you know, I had to learn those lessons, you know, and I'm glad, you know, I learned them. And I'm glad these guys are still here no matter what, you know. <laughs>